Barbara Moss. And Shannon Lashley. Uh, Our firm is Elder Law of Nashville. Uh, And we're going to talk about what made us so happy to do Elder Law. And one of the reasons we're doing this podcast, or the reason we even reach out in any way, is not because of competition. It's because our potential clients often don't know they need us. Um, In the United States, we do a terrible job of imagining that we might die And we do a terrible job of imagining that we might be disabled before we die. And so we don't educate people about the steps that they could take um, to plan for the future and make that a process easier, uh, not only easier, but joyful. Mm -hmm. So walking each other home. Yeah. And if you could just um, insert my favorite joke, please. Okay, so this is, uh, I like to be impactful and not necessarily funny, but um, the favorite joke I like to tell is that there are two prisoners who are waiting to be executed, and they're standing next to the gallows, and they have their hoods over their heads, and one of them nudges the other one and says, you know, this really is worse than public speaking. (laughs) So, um, yeah, only in America would we claim that we fear public speaking more than death. But the real truth is we all know we're going to die. And so what we like to do is help people on that journey to have a more joyful existence and to have a calm and peaceful relationship with their families and not to be so worried about housing, income, health care, and managing chronic conditions. So we do life care planning. But on our very first podcast, I feel like we need to say what it is that drew us to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Shannon has listened to me tell my story so many times. I feel so bad about that. (laughs) They're great stories. Your story is a great story. That's why I'm here with you today. Well, I always tell people, someday you'll be the old lawyer with the stories. <laughs> so, um, I did not grow up thinking that I'd be a lawyer. Nobody, no girl grew up thinking that she should would be a lawyer. But I've been told by people in your elementary school that you were the smartest in your class. Oh, that's nice. Mm-hmm. Well, I was the teacher's pet. I knew how to do that. <laughs> but... Um, Actually, when I was, my dad was a veterinarian, and I once said to him, when I grow up, I want to be a veterinarian. And he said, oh, girls can't do that. Hmm. So, you know, years later, he apologized for saying that. But that's how how I grew up. And then um, I can't, I never fit in um, and until I got to Vanderbilt and found my group. And um, I got to Vanderbilt in 1968. And the 60s got to Vanderbilt in 1970. (laughs) So I was a hippie co-ed and joined a group that went off to Appalachia to take health care to underserved communities in remote parts of Appalachia. Now, there's no place that's remote anymore compared to then. And what were you studying when you were at Vanderbilt? Uh, I majored in philosophy. Mm -hmm. And... um, I later thought, you know, that has shaped my life a lot. I don't pick up books about philosophy, but I feel like I think about things, I ponder things. So anyway, after I got out of Vanderbilt, I I got married and um, to a charming, handsome pediatrician who rode a motorcycle and then spent two years on the job market with my degree in philosophy, being a secretary, a welfare worker, and a waitress. And at that point... I said, well, I know how to go to school, and I went back to law school at Vanderbilt. And at that time, women were just starting to make up one-third of the law school classes. Uh, And when I finished law school with a six-month-old baby, I was the first woman hired by any of the big downtown law firms. And uh, I wanted to be a trial lawyer. And the good part of that story is that I had no idea that was going to be hard. I had no idea that was going to be hard. I may have been the most um, 
what's the word? Not uh, naive. Naive. <laughs> <laughs> naive person. And the only bad part about not knowing how hard that was going to be is that uh, for the first 10 years, I kept saying to myself, am I not good enough? And eventually I realized that wasn't the problem. And um, I had my second child uh, at that first law firm. And then when my girls were seven and four, my ex-husband signed the divorce papers on his way to drug rehab. Mm -hmm. And I was a single mom and a trial lawyer for 22 years. And I walked out of that law firm every day at five o'clock because daycare ended at 530. Mm -hmm. And there was no other alternative. And that had its good sides and it had its bad side. I always had a life outside of law. Mm -hmm. And my law firms always resented me. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. Now. Didn't you tell me about keeping photos of your children on your desk at one point? Oh, yeah. When I started practicing law, the, I had pictures of my children on my desk, mm-hmm. and the men did not do that. Right. Uh, later they did. Mm-hmm. Things changed. Mm-hmm. Things gradually changed. Um, I broke through the glass ceiling at 19 years out of law school. Uh, I had huge cases. The first fully belted child killed by an airbag was in Nashville, and that was my case. Um And, you know, I I really loved litigation. And then 15 years ago, I married my husband, Tom Tom Campbell, whose superpower is that he never judges anyone. That's so true. And for the first time, somebody had my back. And the thing about psychoanalysts, well, he's a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. (laughs) One of my friends said, well, that'll save you a lot of money. <laughs> and But they never quit. They love what they do so much. So, and so after I'd been married to Tom a couple of years, a couple of three years, I picked up my head one day and said, you know, litigation is kind of stressful. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know what I was going to do next. And I looked around. And seniors were the most underrepresented people in Nashville. I mean, the full range of representation, um, getting them benefits, Medicare, Medicaid, veterans benefits, conservatorships, probate. Um, There's some litigation parts to elder law, but there's a lot that's government regulations, Social Security, all the things. That, it's the only practice of law that's defined by the age of the person that you're helping. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I looked around, said, I want to do that. And in true trial lawyer fashion, 10 years ago, I opened my own law firm doing things I didn't know how to do. <laughs> and it was a hard study. It was a hard study. But I want to say, I do know what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. Um, And it turns out, you know, you the only good, I always told my girls, um, there are no good jobs that you can master in under five years. Mm -hmm. Um, But so, and I also found that, you know, that, that journey into elder law, I just backed my way. I didn't start out as a five-year-old and say, I want to grow up and be an elder law attorney. (laughs) You kind of back your way into Mm -hmm. the best jobs. So, you know, I I didn't pick this line of work for this reason, but it turned out that the very reason that I love it the most is that I get to take other people's anxiety away. Because I know what it's like to be anxious. Mm -hmm. Um, I should tell my hat story, shouldn't I? Please do. (laughs) So in Nashville, most people know me because of the hats that I wear. And I have a big collection. Not as big as Thelma Harper, but Mm -hmm. it's a big collection. But the reason that I started wearing a hat is this. In 1992, I went to D.C. for a seminar. And while I was there, a friend of mine was the lawyer for Al Gore. He was the highest muckety-muck in Washington I would ever know. Mm -hmm. And I bought a hat. 
And when I wore that hat, I thought about how well my friend was doing. And I I bought another hat. Mm -hmm. And then my law partners started saying, where's your hat? Mm -hmm. Where's your hat? Mm -hmm. And it became a shopping opportunity. (laughs) And um, I love a shopping opportunity. (laughs) But here's what I found out about wearing a hat. Number one, everyone talks to me when I wear a hat. <laughs> Homeless people, wait staff, people in grocery stores. Okay, person in a grocery store told me my favorite hat story ever. She said, my grandmother bought a hat for $50 during the Depression. And I said to her, Nana, how could you afford a hat in the Depression for $50? And she said, honey, it matched my outfit. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, hmm. the reason number two that I that I wore a hat is I discovered that men love women in hats. That is so true. But the third reason, and maybe the most important reason, is that when you wear a hat and you're a woman, you don't have to take it off when you're inside mm-hmm. and you look confident. So I'm an expert at looking confident. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of like whistle while you work. Eventually you become more confident as you play the confident person. But, you know, single mom and trial lawyer, I know what it's like to be anxious. Mm -hmm. I know what it's like to have no plan B. Yeah. So. And so many of our clients come to us. So many of our clients come to us. Barbara, now what? Mm -hmm. My mom has dementia. My wife has Parkinson's. My husband had a stroke. Now what? How do we plan for this? How do we manage this? And that's what we love. Right. Right. That's what we love. Yeah. But I want to talk about elder law. Yeah. Well, I was thinking, yeah, that was my lead into, um, I don't know, tell a story about how you took someone's anxiety away. Well. That that's that's the greatest pleasure that you derive from this work that we do. Which um, I think you, you also could say you felt as a litigator. You know, when um, maybe you could tell the story of um, the um, Transformer um, in downtown uh, Nashville. And yeah, going people to the in Nashville and- will remember this story. There were two people from Seattle, Washington, who had just retired, who were walking in downtown Nashville. This is about 1995, 94, something like that. And they were in front of the NASCAR cafe, which is gone now. And when you walk in downtown Nashville and you're going over a big grate, what's underneath that grate is called a transformer. And the transformer is about um, six feet wide, eight feet high, four feet thick, and holds oil. And it's used to step down the electrical current that runs under the street into something that can be used in the business. Well, when these lovely people were walking down the sidewalk, the transformer exploded and they were terribly burned. There was a guy on a um, ladder mm-hmm. painting up next to him. He, he fell into the hole with the transformer. They were terribly burned. Um, the guy that fell into the hole died, Mm -hmm. and they were taken to the hospital. And here's one of the things I love about Nashville. At least 20 people, when they heard this story, dropped what they were doing and went to the hospital. Wow. And one of them was a friend of mine and said, you need to hire Barbara Moss. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the many cases that I handled. And at the time, there was um, law in effect. Well, it shields our public utilities Mm -hmm. from liability. Mm -hmm. So the most that that they could recover for the man that died and each of these two people, one of whom, the wife, had hospital bills that were over a million dollars. The most that they could recover from NES was $250,000 each. Oh, my gosh. So eventually we were able to get the legislature to pass a law that said that if you were walking down Broadway when a, on such and such a date and a transformer exploded, mm-hmm. you can have all the money you want. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, helping people, 
You know, you don't think li- of litigators as helping people. I, yeah, but I they don't know do. If the, yeah, the general public certainly doesn't think about it that yeah. way. But once they get to know someone like you who spent their life litigating and yeah. standing up for people. and You have to care about your clients. Yeah. You have to care about your clients. And uh, now the only part about litigation I uh, didn't like was losing. Mm. I certainly won more than my fair share. Mm. But lawyers who say I never lose a case are not trying the right cases. <sighs> you know, you only try the ones that are difficult and hard to settle. Mm-hmm. You know, if your client's guilty, you know what you need to do. You need to settle. Mm-hmm. If your client's not guilty, well, in the civil sense, you know what you need, need to do. Mm-hmm. You need to settle. <laughs> and the other side knows you need to settle. <laughs> but when things are tricky, mm-hmm. that's the case that needs to be tried. Yeah. But anyway, I've taken that desire to help people and turned it into a business that I actually like better. The problem with litigation is something called the billable hour. Um, right when I started practicing law, and I, for- I forgot this part of the story. I was the first lawyer, woman, hired by any of the big downtown law firms as this trial lawyer and parent of a six-month-old. But... Um, The problem with litigation, right about the time I started practicing law, lawyers said, oh, we can make more money if we bill people according to the hours that we spend on their case. Mm -hmm. And um, that system is what has made it so expensive that no cases ever get litigated anymore. It's a rare case that actually goes to trial. Johnny Depp. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a Mm -hmm. very rare case. And the reason is, if you can settle a case for $20,000 and the lawyer is going to charge $20,000 to defend your case, then it makes it a lot easier to settle. Now, one part of the billable hour, though, is it rewards plotting, contentious lawyers. Because what are they going to do? They're going to charge their client the max. We, We get what you incentivize. You incentivize a lot of foot dragging, a lot of discovery, which is taking depositions and writing interrogatories, and then everything settles. So what's really fun about litigation is trying the case, and Mm -hmm. you don't get to do that anymore much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I've taken a lot of that. And so when we started an elder law firm, mainly we charge on a flat fee. We charge our clients a fair fee but we don't make them worry about what we're going to charge them at the end. Right. Right. And in addition to lawyers, who else do you have working in the firm? Well, we have, that's great. We have um, a benefit specialist Mm -hmm. that we hired away from 10 care, which is Medicaid. The dreaded 10 care. 10 care, which is, you know, well, I like what you say about elder law, that you can't really say you're practicing elder law unless you have the 10 care knowledge. Unless in, you can get people firm. on Medicaid, you're not right. really. So a lot of people started, a lot of lawyers started doing uh, estate planning. Mm-hmm. And when they began doing estate planning, the threshold for paying taxes on an estate was 250000 300000 in your estate. Right now, it's $11.5 million. So a lot of lawyers who used to do estate planning now put elder law on their websites, but they don't really do elder. If you can't get somebody on Medicaid, you're not really doing elder law. If you can't get someone on Medicaid who has some money. Yeah, and what you want to do is people don't really understand the Medicaid laws either. They're, they're laws that are out there to protect the spouse at home. Right. Maybe you could tell um, that one story. Recently, we had uh, those brothers come into the office who were trying to care for their mom in a facility. And I believe that at one point, she went into a 10-care accepting facility with around $300,000 with a husband at home. Right. And And they were told, oh, you just have to spend down everything. Yeah. And they they came into our office at about $5,000 left. Right. And then you explain to them what could have been done after they pressed because one of them actually worked for the government and and one of them cried in front yeah. of us, not realizing. They could have saved 
half or more of that money for the spouse at home. It was awful. And those laws were passed in the 80s. Um, They're called the anti-spousal impoverishment laws. Mm -hmm. At the time, um, and I hope some listeners remember this, they were running stories in the press about women being so impoverished by getting their husbands on Medicaid that they were eating cat food. We actually had a client who worked at Kroger back then Mm -hmm. who remembered women coming in to get cat food to eat. Mm -hmm. So there are laws out there to protect the spouse at home. Mm -hmm. There are ways to protect money. And if you don't know how to do that, you're really not doing elder law. Such an important point to make. I, I want to um, end this podcast by saying we really care about our clients. We really want to see them get the best possible care. We want to see them get the best possible care in appropriate housing. We all say, a senior say, we want to live and die at home. But sometimes home is dangerous and often home is isolating. So we're here to help people age in a way that has dignity and purpose and love.